will inspire you and uh, be things that you remember really well. So with that, um, uh, I'm going to introduce you to Deanna, Jack, and Corinne. And uh, we're going to talk about their stories and we're going to talk about them uh, one by one. I'll help, I'll help uh, navigate their stories and they'll tell you uh, what they were going through. So we'll start with Deanna, who's in my right lower box. Deanna, can you say hi and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Deanna Pomfret. Um, so yeah. thanks for doing this, Deanna. Um, so um, just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do for a living, and then I'll put up, pull up your slides and we can go chronologically. So I am uh, happily uh, a mom and a wife. Uh, first and foremost, I put my family and my, uh, my relationship with my husband first, but I also happen to be a coach. I own my own business athletic pursuits and I work with adults, um, much like you, you guys and um, your parents, uh, maybe even your parents' parents. <laughs> I, have, uh, uh, I work with athletes of all ages and abilities and I help them with their athletic pursuits and that's the name of my business. I also teach at Merrimack College um, Intro to Public Health and uh, Nutritional Sciences. Uh, so that's what I do nowadays. Great, uh, when you're not staying at home that is. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, right now I do everything from home. So even coaching from home, which has been a real adventure. That's right. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, share my screen. So I'll bring up a PowerPoint um, deck. And just for the students, I didn't share this with you because it has pictures of the patient. So you don't need to have the files. You could just follow along. Um, all right. You can all see those slides, right? Yep. All right, so Deanna, this is a picture of you, um, I think about 15 years ago, is that right? 21 years and one 21 year. years ago. Only because my son just turned 21 that, that's right. That's right. <laughs> during COVID, so yeah. So, I, so tell us about your life at this point, um, and then I'll fast forward a little bit and you can tell us how things changed. This was, um, so I, this was, this, my son's my second of three children. And uh, this was a, a wonderful point in my life. Things were getting really busy and full. And I remember I started running for the first time because I had these two little babies. Um, and I would pop them both in a stroller and go for a run. And I started discovering uh, physical fitness in a way I had never before. I've always been um, healthy and active and uh, but at this point, I think I was finding sanity in it and enjoying the heck out of it. So uh, I, f I felt great. I mean, I was young. I was having these beautiful children and um, enjoying life. Okay, great. And I, I should have said this before I had you start, but as you guys know, there's this patient clinic. Um, we typically would have had five patients, but I didn't want to have six Zoom screens, including myself. So we split it into two parts. And this first part is going to focus on Addison's disease or primary adrenal insufficiency. It's not a diagnostic mystery, but I want you to see the different perspectives and the different manifestations. And so that's kind of how I'm navigating the interview here. So Deanna is talking about uh, something 21 years ago, and then I'm just going to lead forward with these um, these pictures here, and I think it's cut off on my screen. I believe that says 2011, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, so 10 years later, fast forward yeah. 10 years, they went by in a flash. So many things happened. I had my third baby, um, I started my own business. I remember I did a triathlon uh, with a lo my local YMCA, and I discovered how much I just loved swimming, biking, and running. And so um, I loved it so much, I decided I was going to make it my profession. And I educated myself and then I went off and got all sorts of certifications. I even got a master's in health and wellness. Uh, I really took this seriously and, and created a business from it. Um, awesome. I, yeah, I, I can get into like when things went south if you want, because. Well, you know, when I see this picture, so that's really helpful. So 10 years have passed and you went from having your first child to now having your own business, uh, deep interest in um, uh, endurance sports. And I noticed two things in this picture, and maybe you can take it off from there. Is the first is you look different, and maybe you can comment on that. And then on the right here, you clearly are competing in some sort of event or race. So uh, do, you, do you think you look different? And maybe you can describe to the students what you were thinking at the time and what you think now about your appearance, because it 
we can see you in the box and we saw what you look like 10 years prior to this, but you look clearly different. Mm -hmm. At the time, I didn't know I looked different. Other people told me I looked different. My brother told me, why are you going to a tanning bed? Um, I'd have people ask me if I had been on some tropical vacation. All the time I answered no. And um, in this picture, this was like probably when I hit rock bottom, believe it or not. And there I was running the Medoc Marathon. Um, it's, the, it's a marathon in Bordeaux, France, and it's called the Marathon de Medoc. And it's just like every marathon, 26.2 miles, except you have a wine tasting every mile. So that's 26 wine tastings throughout this <laughs> So it was awesome. So I, I'd always had dreams about this. Like I, I ha always have to have some like nugget to look forward to. And whenever I did my athletics, I just, I always had these little things that I would do to, I wasn't getting on the podium. So I would rather, rather just come up with these little, you know, motivation pieces. So this was one of my, um, this was my second marathon. My first one was in Cape Cod and I had done that and I had started experiencing some kind of anomalies, like things that just should never happen when you're training. Like um, I'd go out, I will have, I knew I ate well, I knew I hydrated well, I'd go out and run, I'd come back and I, I'd go out and run for like three or four miles and I would just stop and I'd come back home and I just didn't feel good. I'd get dizzy, um, it just, things were not right. And that was a few years before this race. So, you know, just like three years prior to this 2011 event. Um, and I remember I, my quads would ache. I remember going to my doctor and he would just tell me, you know, maybe you need to quit running. Maybe you need to quit coaching. Maybe you need to rest more, do some yoga. And I just didn't buy it. I just didn't like the sounds of that. Um, that didn't sound right to me. So I just kept moving forward doing what I was doing, but making compromises. So I started kind of just taking things off my list that I just, you know, I wouldn't stay up late. I quit my French book club, which I loved. Um, I started working out less. I even swapped running for swimming. And as I was leading up to this wonderful marathon in France, I wasn't even running. And so I don't, I don't know how I did it. I really don't. But you finished uh, the marathon, right? I finished it in the time allotted, which was five and a half hours. The ironic thing is, and this is where it, it's just crazy to me that I even survived it. Um, they extended, there's a cutoff time for five hours. And that's like a 12 minute mile. I mean, you can go through the whole race, have your drinks, have some fun enjoy all the festivities and still cross the finish line that year it was so hot it was 80 degrees and so they said oh we're going to give you all a half hour extra to finish the race and thank god they did because i had to walk a good part of it i was sick to my stomach i had to there, there were it's like it's, europe is so different than than the united states this would never fly in the united states but they had literally 10 porta potties for, I can't even remember how many thousands of athletes there were or runners. And so people just went into the fields. They went into the vines and Bordeaux's best and just helped fertilize their, their grapes. So, um, you know, I always think of that when I drink my Bordeaux wine mm -hmm. every now and then. So, um, but you know, I mean, that's what we did. And I remember being very sick that day. I remember my husband um, trying to get me to drink water. And I didn't want it. I just did not want it. There was something inside of me that knew, I think if I drank water, I would have been in an ambulance. <laughs> uh, I just knew something was really bad going on. For, the for the students, based on the pathophysiology of Addison's disease, when you see her, and she said this was around the time where she hit rock bottom, uh, she looks thinner and she looks fairly dark. And based on the pathophysiology, you have to imagine that the reason she's, her skin is this hyperpigmented must be that the cortisol levels have become extremely low. There is no negative feedback. And if that doesn't make sense, please review the concept videos or my lecture. Um, uh, so you wouldn't imagine that somebody who's hitting a nadir of cortisol levels could run a marathon, especially in 88 degree weather. The other pathophysiology of Addison's, it's, it's a problem with volume. You've lost too much sodium and water or saline now it's 88 degrees and you don't have any adrenal hormones, cortisol or aldosterone. How did she run a marathon? And I think 
Uh, you got very lucky that you did not pass out or die during this marathon. You must have had enough reserve and you were probably in tremendous shape, which helped you make it, but, but you probably were flirting um, with disaster. And I would ask, did you crave salt at any time? Were you craving salt yeah. or salty things? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, and, and in fact, um, just leading up to this uh, race, I, when I was training, training, which was like going out and running a, a couple miles and coming home, um, I think the longest I ran was 16 miles, and that was in July, and the race was in September. So when I was um, doing anything physically active, I would get the the craziest salt cravings and my grandfather had high blood pressure so I, I was like oh my god I'm gonna have high blood pressure I really shouldn't eat all this salt and I was craving it so much I was drinking pickle juice which I just thought was just so delicious <laughs> and so I would drink pickle juice um, even during this race I'm sitting on a bus so we had take a bus from Bordeaux Center out to to the vineyards to start our race and I remember on the way back I had already, you know, I'd, ha I'd eaten a little bit after the race. I wasn't like really hungry or anything um, or even that thirsty, but there was a lady behind me and I could hear her eating chips. And I was like, <laughs> salt and vinegar chips, I just know it. And I wanted to ask her, like I wanted them. <laughs> and no, I was just still craving salt. It was crazy. Like I, I didn't understand. <laughs> So for the students, you know, this is not a type of history that most patients offer to you. You have to know to ask it. And, uh, just, you know, drinking pickle juice right out of the bottle, eating salt and craving it is not something patients tell you unless you know to ask it. And you'll see I'll ask every patient the same thing and just hear what they have to say. Um, so um, I will fast forward a little bit. You know, it, I mentioned a lot of people don't make it to the end of that race. A lot of patients with Addison's are diagnosed when they push their body beyond the limit and basically collapse, low blood pressure, severe hyponatremia and high potassium, which you are probably in danger of having, but I, I suspect your fitness going into that race spared you uh, a disaster or, or an ambulance visit at that time. But shortly thereafter, when you got back, multiple physician visits, you had low sodium levels. Um, we talked about your diffuse tanning that didn't make sense. It was even in non-sun exposed regions. Um, you were craving salty things much more so than usual. You had some weight loss, which we didn't mention. And then ultimately your labs did show a very low cortisol and a very high ACTH, which is consistent with primary adrenal insufficiency, also termed Addison's disease. And you were treated with a replacement for cortisol and aldosterone, hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone. Um, and you are also simultaneously diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, which is very common, uh, also called primary hypothyroidism. So how did you feel after you were treated? You know, tell us how, did, how it felt. Was it an instantaneous thing? Was it gradual? Were there ups and downs? So, you know, it's interesting. I, I wanted it to be instantaneous. Um, it, because of my expectations were really high, even my mother-in-law, who's a, also a doctor, she came with me to the appointment, uh, my first appointment at Brigham and Women's, and even told my doctor, look, she, she has very high expectations of what she wants to do with her life here. And, um, you know, this is, this is serious. And I didn't know it was serious at the time. I, I was going to go get um, a second opinion with a homeopathic doctor, maybe. And I was going to kind of out exercise, outfit, out health, my, uh, my diagnose with, diagnosis, which I know is crazy, totally crazy. And it took the doctors, I mean, I had a long appointment, a really long appointment. And they were trying to explain to me, look, you got to, you got to take this medicine with you everywhere you go. You've got to take this. So it took me a long time, I think, just to kind of figure out how to live with it. It took me about a year just to get to a point where I could maintain muscle mass, I could get back out there, be physically active. And then the next year, I really, I hit it hard and I had a blast and I got back into the things I love. And so that first year was so important, I think, to take it slowly and to be really careful about whatever changes I made to, and so that I got on a daily regimen that was right for me and what, what I wanted to do. And so since then, I've, it's, the sky's the limit. Great, I mean, for the students, most patients who have Addison's who get diagnosed, when you give them back 
hydrocortisone or fludrocortisone, their replacement, they do notice a dramatic improvement. You know, it's almost a miraculous type thing within 24 hours. In Deanna's case, you did have an improvement, but your basal level was such an, you were such a uh, high level athlete that yeah. for you to do the things that were important for you, for your right. quality of life, for your, uh, for your business, your uh, employment, and for your personal satisfaction, you want it to function at a much higher level. And the tricky thing there is when you push your body running, racing, long distance, uh, you need more cortisol. And then as you lose fluids, you know, you lose water and salt through sweat, you have to replace those fluids and salt and you have to sometimes adjust your doses. So it's, um, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. And those were adjustments that took time and they still take time, right? These are some pictures of your family and you can see the differences more recently. And, you know, you ultimately did things like running more marathons, triathlons, but uh, we're not going to go through the whole regimen of how we did it, but it took work, but we did it. It takes work. And like one of the biggest messages I wanted to say today is it's great to get the diagnosis right. It's important. It's life-saving. But there's also the treatment long-term that you have in the relationship you have with your doctor that's so important that allows you to live uh, the kind of life you want to live, whatever it is. So I, that's what I'm most grateful for is these things never would have happened without exceptional health care. Great. And, um, and I'm going to add one extra piece to this story because ah. <laughs> you are able to do this. You know, I think it, this happened right after this. You did yeah. the marathon. I remember we, we checked your labs along the way on long runs. We adjusted your sodium. You carried sodium tabs. You had extra hydrocortisone, fludrocortisone, lots of hydration, and you can see you're smiling as you cross the finish line. Yeah. Um, and then um, I think in this subsequent year, on a multiple occasions, you had more anxiety. We checked a bunch of labs, and your TSH was always on the low end. So I had, uh, you know, the, you had some weight fluctuation. I thought maybe your levothyroxine dose was too high, but her TSH kept coming back low, low, low. Um, and even though I decreased the levothyroxine multiple times, her TSH remained low and, uh, your heart rate was always 60 or 70, but your basal heart rate was what? 50. Right. So this 48. is, so, so, you know, tachycardia, we always often say, you know, so if someone is thyrotoxic, they're tachycardic, but 70 is relatively tachycardic for her. You, you guys know me by now, and nothing is normal or abnormal. It's all about relative to the context. And if so, someone's heart rate is in the 40s or low 50s, and now suddenly their heart rate runs 70, 75, that's high. Mm -hmm. And so this was actually her manifesting thyrotoxic. And until I looked at her neck, and hopefully you can all see this picture and see a big goiter. That's her neck, and uh, that's, not, that's not supposed to be there. It's not supposed to be that big. Um, so she had actually Graves' disease, which is another autoimmune disease, and uh, it can cluster in individuals with autoimmune uh, conditions. And so she had Addison's disease. She was supposedly had Hashimoto's, but there must have been enough thyroid parenchyma around that auto uh, antibodies were able to stimulate the thyroid. And um, this is her thyroid uptake. They studied the thyroid last week. Uh, and so they know that this is diffuse uptake consistent with Graves' disease, especially when the TSH is suppressed. And she ultimately, after a brief stint with methimazole, was treated definitively with radioactive iodine and is now totally hypothyroid and we can manage it with levothyroxine. So did we do a good job? I think so. <laughs> right. um, I, mean, I, did, I did two half Ironman last year. So I, I'd say we're doing pretty, pretty well. <laughs> well. I have normal adrenal glands and I cannot run a marathon. So that's pretty good. <laughs> so we will keep Deanna's story in mind because we're going to revisit different elements of each of the patient's stories and you will see some commonalities and some differences. And we will shift to Jack's story. So Jack, um, maybe let's start around here or wherever you want. Why don't you introduce yourself, who you are, uh, what you do or whatever you want to share with the students and then uh, take us to this picture in 2009 and uh, whatever you want to tell us about it. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody, or whenever you're watching it. Um, my name is Jack Biddick. Um, I'm a uh, father of three. I have a lovely wife. I've been married for 
42 years now. Um, I have seven grandchildren. Um, and as you can see, I've, I've always lived a very full and active life. Um, uh, you know, I've always been an avid runner, uh, weightlifter, you know, rock climber, mountain climber. Um, this picture is with two of my best buds. Uh, we just came off the high point in Arizona and uh, celebrating our achievement uh, up in the, uh, the high places, which is where I love to be. And, and uh, my brother-in-law, who's the uh, white-haired gentleman, is a New York City fireman, uh, captain, and uh, he and I have been all over the world together um, uh, climbing some of the highest peaks. So uh, that's my love, uh, my family. Uh, I'm also C COO of a a company that makes medical uh, DNA RNA test kits. Uh, so, um, uh, and uh, and I also have ha love uh, these places with uh, two of my sons. The third th son thinks we're crazy, but I rock climb with one and uh, I mountain climb with the other. So, um, a very active kind of crazy family. Right, so another very active person, and I'm actually going to stop sharing the slides for a second so you can see everyone's faces a little bit closer because Jack's, the next pictures I'm gonna show you, I think Jack's physical findings were a little bit more subtle. So while people look at you, sorry to put you on the spot, but you know, in a real auditorium, they would be able to see you more closely. Um, tell us what happened between this picture and the next one I'm gonna show. What, did you notice anything different about your physical stamina, appearance, anything like that? So in 2009, right after that photo was taken, um, I, I, my son was living in Louisville in it with his wife. And we we'd go out for the Derby Festival and run the marathon. And I told him, I don't feel like running the marathon. Let's do the half this year. And about three quarters through the race, my son came up behind me and he said, Dad, what's wrong? I've never been able to beat you in a marathon, a half marathon in my life. And I said, I, I just cramping up. My, my, I just feel like every part of me is cramping. And uh, he said, okay, well, it's very hot, so take it easy. And uh, I crossed the uh, finish line, probably one of the worst times I've ever had. And I came across the line and I went down. And everybody crowded around me, thought I had had a heart attack. Um, and um, uh, my calf was up behind my kneecalf. Um, I, I had, you know, Ooh. gone back. So um, I noticed that, you know, about this time, I, I was really craving salt. But my wife had just been diagnosed with uh, colorectal cancer. So I kept thinking, oh, well, I'm just, I'm just, you know, up against it because of her. And, um, you know, but I, I found this general decline from 2009, 10. I just, everything I did was 11 and 12. And um, I, I started saying to the guys, no, I can't go out on trips. I started declining. I had gone out with my son uh, to the Grand Tetons for his graduation present. And and he and I have rock climbed all over, and we were climbing the Grand Teton, and I backed out of climbing the Grand Teton, which I've always wanted to do because I didn't have the stamina to do it. I, I slept at high camp because I was so wasted from getting from the parking lot to high camp. So he climbed it, and I had to sit and watch and um, felt terribly, but I had no energy um, whatsoever. So... You, you see this photo, um, that's my, my son, uh, my youngest son to the left, and we, he said, we want to take my father-in-law out backpacking. And I took him on this very mellow trip in Vermont, and um, you could see I, I, I had lost all muscle mass. Um, my, my wife kept complaining because my tan was darker than hers. I'm Irish. I don't tan. I, I get red and I burn and I, you know, and I had this, this like really ugly tan. And um, uh, I took this trip up, I struggled to get up uh, to this lake and I kept um, getting stomach sick, like Deanne was talking about, Deanna. Um, I, I, I couldn't keep food down other than salty stuff. Um, that's all I wanted. I, I wanted 
potato chips, no protein, just give me potato chips. That's all I wanted, or pretzels. Great, so that's another salt craving, uh, some weight loss, but you know, your physical manifestations are not as dramatic as Deanna's were, but your story, you know, and it's uh, both of your stories start off with someone who's like in a kind of a, a very high percentile of physical fitness, so it makes it extra challenging, but you're describing a decline to a state that is probably still a higher physical state than the average person, which makes it difficult. But you know, if you put all of those things together, you can tell that something is not right. And I think saying you're Irish, you've never tanned in your life, you've always become red or burned, and now you're suddenly getting true hyperpigmentation. It's unusual at the very least. Um, so what happened next? I'm just gonna summarize a little bit and then we'll have you tell us what happened. You um, describe some weight loss, you describe this kind of fatigue, and even more so that fatigue really doesn't begin to describe the nuance of what you just went through. This tanning, this intense salt craving. Um, and then you ultimately were diagnosed after you had uh, gastroenteritis. You came to the ER and you were very um, hypotensive, low blood pressure. So tell us about that. So, um, so. I was sick for about a week. I could not clear a simple 24-hour bug that my grandson gave me. And um, uh, I, I finally got up, showered, you know, waited for my wife to wake up and said, I, I've got to go to the ER. Um, I said, I, I feel like I'm ready to die. And um, uh, I hit the ER, and I believe my uh, blood pressure um, was um, it was uh, it was something like eighty three over fifty one. I, I, you know, I bottomed out. Um, uh, my my potassium was through the roof. My my salt was my sodium levels were bottomed out, and um, so they put me. They admitted me into the hospital based on my salt, and a, a doc came in and said. Yeah, you'll be better. You'll feel better in the morning. And and luckily they moved the floors and I and I got another hospitalist. They walked in and he looked at me and he said, I don't know what's wrong with you. I'm not the smartest guy in the hospital, but I know the smartest person in the hospital. And I'm gonna have them come see you because there's something definitively wrong with you. We have to figure it out. And I wept. I was like, Finally, somebody was paying attention to me because I had gone to like eight different docs and with all these different kind of feelings, but it was, people would tell me I was depressed and I was like, I'm not depressed. I'm, I just don't feel well. And um, so uh, a, a very young um, uh, doc came in and sat down and, and um, he asked me a bunch of questions and he said, do you have a craving for salt? I said, doc, I need a, a 12 step program for salt. <laughs> I said, I see a salt shaker and I want to put it into my mouth. I, I, <laughs> I, put, I put hot sauce on potato chips and then salt them because I don't get enough salt. <laughs> and he said, I think I know what's wrong with you. And uh, he came back, did a bunch of blood tests, came back about four hours later, and he said, my belief is you have Addison's disease. And um, I, I cried because I, I, I thought my life was over. And uh, he, he <laughs> they didn't know much at the hospital. I was at about it. So at 8 o'clock at night, they gave me my first dose of, uh, of hydrocortisone. So I walked the halls all night long because I was so hyped up. I was so excited to have energy. I, they were like, nurses were like, this is like your 80th lap around. Yeah. I said, no, isn't it great? <laughs> no, that's great. I, I, just, I want to point out a couple of things that you said in that, like lots of great points for the students, you know, you can present hypotensive after a bad gastro viral gastroenteritis. So norovirus or any of these viral gastroenteritis, you can have lots of diarrhea, volume loss, nausea, vomiting. And because you can't keep fluids down because you keep throwing them up for 24 hours, people can get very volume depleted and you might have a low normal blood pressure. You might even be slightly hyponatremic, but um, somebody who saw him thought this is just not right. 
Okay, they didn't know what the diagnosis was, but they had a clinical intuition. And all of you uh, students are learning to develop a clinical intuition. We often say in medicine, uh, a good student or a good resident or intern can understand sick or not sick. You don't have to be the, you know, the smart, smarty pants who knows every rare diagnosis, although that's great also. But can you tell who's sick and who's not sick? Because even if you don't know the final answer, you can figure out who needs more help who you need to ask for help, which is what happened in Jack's case. And if you watch my mm -hmm. adrenal physiology video, you know how I feel about blood pressure, 83 over 50, that ain't right. And it means the body's screaming to keep that normal. And then he probably had profound hyponatremia. I don't remember how low the sodium was at the top of my head, but someone put those together and said, this just doesn't seem right. And that's what led to his diagnosis. And this presentation is more typical of how Addison's presents. Somebody describes declining symptoms, just like Jack did, and then ultimately crashes and goes to an ER. And unfortunately, many of those times they're still not diagnosed and some diagnoses are found when they're even more critically ill. So I think in some ways, Jack was lucky that some intelligent, smart person said, I don't know, but I'm going to find out and we'll look deeper and they finally figured out the answer. And so um, Jack was also treated and he did much better. And maybe I'll let you tell the students about all the wild worldwide activities you've been up to since then. Uh, this is Tangboche Monastery. I was so excited. Uh, it's on the way to Everest Base Camp. And, and to understand that thinking in 2014, my life was over. I, I was old before my time, and I was never going to do anything I loved again. That's how I felt. And after I was diagnosed, I said, I will not allow this disease to define me. And I went back to all the things that I loved doing. I started running weightlifting. And like Deanna said, it, it took a good year to start building up. Uh, I did the uh, traverse up in, uh, up in the White Mountains. And, uh, you know, it, it, I struggled through it. But I got it. I get, it started doing more and more, the presidential traverse. I started doing more and more. And I finally worked up in 2016. This was at Everest, uh, heading to Everest Base Camp and going to all the places I'd already always read about. And uh, this past year, my brother-in-law and I did the Walkers Hout Route in Switzerland, 128 miles, 10 days, uh, something like 35,000 vertical feet climbed over those 10 days. And uh, it was just a blast, and, and I'm back to doing the things I love. I have the energy to play with my grandkids. My wife and I walked the Camino de Santiago uh, in between the two trips. It, it, it just, it's so great to have my life back um, and uh, to, to feel again um, like I used to feel. So uh, That's wonderful. And for the students, uh, there are uh, some caveats. They, they, Deanna and Jack, they do all these activities. They do have to adjust their doses at times. There are other emergency measures. I think when you went to Mount Everest, you took dexamethasone, um, which is often, you, dexamethasone is a glucocorticoid, very potent, which is often a treatment for altitude uh, uh, sickness, which at, even at base camp, you can get altitude issues. But it's also a glucocorticoid, which for someone with Addison's can give you a little boost. So there are other considerations. But um, I like to tell all my patients with Addison's and adrenal insufficiency that with these treatments, you should be able to live or achieve a completely uh, full and normal life. And if not that, it's very close to it. And if that's not true, we need to work to figure out how to do that. So. So that's After that, cool. yeah, I got to say, he was so great because um, he, he, I said, hey, I want to go to Everest Space Camp. And he was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, worked, we worked through how I would do it. And I had my emergency kit. My, my brother-in-law was totally, you know, uh, knew what to do and how we were going to treat me. And I had, you know, people ready to pick me up by helicopter or something happened. But we took all the precautions. But I did it without any issue oh just one day and i took some more hydrocortisone i got through the day fine so great thanks for sharing i'm going to uh move to uh corinne last but not least i'm gonna let everyone see you because i think in some ways you have the most dramatic pictures <laughs> um and uh, uh it, it's good to compare, not put you on the spot so um do you want to introduce yourself to start? Who are you? Where, what do you do? Or anything you'd like to share with the students? 
Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Corinne Goler. I um, have done a plethora of things in my life. <laughs> I'm currently actually a stay-at-home mom. I was teaching um, uh, at uh, high school and before I just before I became a stay-at-home mom and I was a teacher for health and PE actually and I um, married to a wonderful husband and I have two children an almost five-year-old as he will tell you every day and uh, just turned three-year-old you can see the three in the in the balloon in the background <laughs> Uh, and my older one's a boy and a girl. So, and I have a dog that's sleeping next to me on the floor. So that's yep. life. That's <laughs> and in a way, we're going to start the story with the birth of your children. So a lot has happened for you in the last five years, actually beyond just Addison's. Uh, so you've had an mm. extremely busy life and yes. I will start it off and then have you tell us. So, um, so uh, prior to 2014, things were fine and you mentioned what you were doing for work, but you were healthy. But after I met you in retrospect, maybe for several years, you did have some more fatigue and irritability than usual. It wasn't diagnosed as anything. It was kind of more of a retrospective look. Um, right. And in 2015, so as you said, your son is five years old. You had your first pregnancy and in your first trimester, uh, as you all, as the students know, we, we always check thyroid function in pregnant women because you don't want uh, pregnant women to become hypothyroid. It's something we can easily fix. And there are factors in pregnancy that change thyroid function like HCG. And so her TSH was actually slightly high, not low, but high. Uh, so she was uh, diagnosed with maybe hypothyroidism and started on levothyroxine. Not too uncommon. That's why we do that check. But your first and second trimester with, were really plagued with nausea and vomiting and anorexia. And maybe I'll stop at that before describing the other symptoms, poor weight gain as well. So, you know, moms during pregnancy generally uh, describe increased appetite and are encouraged to gain some weight, not excessive weight, but weight gain. And the opposite was happening. You were throwing up, vomiting, and not gaining weight. And so tell us, was this the standard nausea and vomiting of pregnancy or was it something more? Um, it certainly did not feel normal. I had, you know, been one of the last of my friends to be pregnant as well as I have two sisters and their pregnancies just didn't seem as extreme, I guess. I, I had, in addition to not gaining the weight in my first trimester, I, you know, my doctor would just say to me, you gotta, you gotta eat more. You gotta, and I would, I would tell her I'm, do, I'm doing it. I'm eating, but she would say, eat ice cream. And I would say, I don't want ice cream. All I want is olive juice and olives and potato chips and pickles. And I really didn't have an appetite that, the, that a first trimester or maybe they don't. I mean, maybe again, it can all be explained away by pregnancy because it was, well, I'm nauseous all the time. So maybe that's why you don't want to eat. But for years prior to even getting pregnant between 2010 and 2014 or 15, when I got pregnant, I actually had unintentional weight loss. Didn't realize it because it was a gradual. And so it was just, I don't know. I just, I, everything could be explained away. So but yes, um, I would get very dizzy. I would stand up anytime I stood up or get up, got up from any sitting position. I would just feel like I wanted to faint. Um, you know, the nausea, I just wasn't hungry, the salt, and I could not gain weight. I just couldn't. So, um, and then my skin started to change color. Uh, I was probably like starting the second of my second trimester, I started to notice that my arms were changing color. I mean, this was the middle of winter, right? So it was strange that my skin, and again, I mean, like Jack was saying, I, I have all Irish heritage. I don't have anything else. So it's not like I naturally just tan away. And I had tan on my face. I had, um, and again, in places that you had mentioned, Dr. Vidia, in places that shouldn't be tan, my, my, my nipples were tan. And I remember thinking, 
And I remember asking the doctor thinking, well, is this a part of pregnancy? Is this what happens to nipples when, you know, when you're pregnant? And of course the line between your stomach and the top of, you know, your abdomen, that line a lot that gets accentuated when you're pregnant, it was dark, dark, dark. And I, I just, everything could be explained away. And the doctors, a lot of times were just like, oh, well, you're fatigued because you're pregnant. You have darkness because of, you know, you're pregnant. Everything was pregnant. Um, but I didn't feel right. My whole body ached all over. I couldn't sleep my joints. Um, and, uh, my gums at, at around March. Yeah, I'll show a picture of that I, in a second. Yeah. Yeah. In March, I noticed now I had my son in June, June 6th to be exact. And in March, I was in Florida visiting my parents, and I've always been someone to protect myself from the sun. And so, again, I had this weird tan, and um, I looked in the mirror and I could see my gums. They were changing color. And I thought I was seeing things, but then I showed people and it was true. It was, and it just got progressively worse. Um, so. and for, for the students, they've, they've learned a little bit about pregnancy, but they're going to learn the bulk about pregnancy later. It is true that many of your symptoms overlap with expected phenomena in pregnancy. So um, uh, nausea and vomiting can occur in normal, healthy pregnancies. Sometimes some pregnancies can have excessive nausea and vomiting, and we can even call some of them hyperemesis gravidarum, hyperemesis gravidarum. There are some women, for reasons we don't fully understand, have really just plagued by nausea and vomiting, have to take antiemetics all the way through the pregnancy. Fatigue right. is a part of pregnancy. Feeling a little lightheaded when you get up can happen in pregnancy. You will learn there's many hemodynamic changes in pregnancy, including the physical mass of the uterus pressing against the inferior vena cava, reducing uh, um, cardiac um, a venous return to the heart and cardiac output. Um, darkening of the skin can happen in pregnancy. Nipples, the linea alba, as you mentioned, can get darker. Weird food cravings. Uh, anybody who's, uh, I've lived with someone who's pregnant a couple of times and they, my <laughs> wife had weird experience. So all of these things in some way uh, were not unexpected, but your symptoms were just more severe. And then the, mm -hmm. the, the darkening of the gums and some other pictures that I'll show you started to get even beyond what we'd expect. And what happened is you right. kind of suffered through these symptoms. And in the third trimester, things just got, all of these things just got worse. You were unable to ambulate uh, and do basic things. And you ended up having a C-section at 39 weeks because the baby wasn't growing. You weren't gaining weight and the baby wasn't growing, right? Right. The baby... Um about you know a month or so prior to having him the doctor was concerned because the doctor because the baby just wasn't growing and so for about three weeks before I ended up going in for a c-section they would just measure the baby and monitor the baby on these ultrasounds that I would have to come in for um every week and it was it was concerning because I mean I don't know I thought I was healthy I didn't know what was going on um so I had the C-section when I went in for my uh, delivery. It was a, it ended up being an emergency C-section. And God, it's so hard to look at those. Yeah. <laughs> um, I ended up going in for an emergency. I mean, I went in for intending to have a natural birth, but, you know, of course, uh, my blood pressure was so low and they were asking me the whole time, why is your blood pressure so low? Why is your blood pressure so low? Do you always run so low? And I'm thinking to myself, like, I don't even know anymore. And again, um, going back to uh, <laughs> the others, it's like, I got this lecture from the nurse. Why do I have a tan? I shouldn't be going tanning, especially when I'm pregnant. And it's like, oh my God, I'm not. So yeah, I ultimately, the baby's heart rate started to drop. Um, and of course they rushed me into the uh, emergency room or into an emergency C-section. It was a pretty, very, very traumatic uh, birth. But uh, he, you know, he wasn't breathing when he came out um, for about a minute, but, you know, luckily and thankfully he was okay. Um, can't really explain to you the difficulty of that birth. 
I can only just tell you, but it was, it was hard. I felt like I was going to die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I did not feel that way with my daughter. So it just, yeah, well, now I have perspective. I think that's a key point. So it, it reflects back on what first, here's a picture of your linea, the diffuse skin darkening and the darkening of the linea alba, which can happen in pregnancy. It, it maybe is more striking here and the darkening of your gums. And, uh, you know, I think Deanna mentioned she hit a low point while running a marathon. And as I was mentioning earlier, she basically was just on the brink of having a full blown adrenal crisis. And so was Corinne. You know, you said your words were, I felt like I was going to die. And what's kind of incredible here is um, in pregnancy, our bodies make more cortisol because the stress of pregnancy and other factors you will learn about in pregnancy increase binding globulins. You need more cortisol to do that. And then during labor, you make a tremendous amount of cortisol. And so you had less. And so you, as the preg pregnancy went along, you needed more and more and more, and you were not able to mount that response. My guess is you had just enough adrenal reserve to survive and not die. And often and will. pregnancy is an I had Sorry, I was going to say, and I just had the will, I guess, too. Yeah, that, <laughs> I don't know if that works. That's another but... way to put it. Um, you know, pregnancy is an immune tolerant state. If you think about it, the fetus is uh, not a self antigen. Actually, the fetus is a foreign antigen. It doesn't have the same antigen as the, as the mother. It should be recognized by the immune system as foreign, but it doesn't. Okay, obviously that we wouldn't have survived as a species if that were the case. Uh, so there is some immune tolerance and it's a complicated immune tolerance. But what we notice clinically is that women who are pregnant who have autoimmune diseases, whether it's lupus or Graves disease, they tend to get quiescent during the pregnancy. Things just turn off. And then after the pregnancy, the immune system reconstitutes and the, that autoimmune system, autoimmune disease flares up again. So what probably happened with Corinne is she had Addison's disease and she had declining adrenal function, not completely down, but low. But then during the pregnancy, it stopped declining. And so she had low adrenal function, but enough. But then the stress of the pregnancy started exposing the insufficiency. And uh, in labor, she barely made it, you know, having a low blood pressure in pregnancy is normal, but her blood pressure was very low. And um, you are, you are lucky to survive. This is a picture of you right when your son was born. And um, uh, I, I, you can say something if you want, but I think the, the difference, <laughs> how you look now and how you looked in this picture is very striking. Even to me, I've seen it so many times. Yeah. Um, is this where um, you, did you, how did you feel when your son was born and they let him hold, let you hold him? Oh my God. I mean, I just felt, I, I, I was like just happy because of course he was breathing and I got through it and it was over. Um, but I look at these pictures and it's hard. It's really, really hard to look at them still, even now, just going back to that place. It was very, very frightening. Um, I was in a lot of pain, but look at him. He's perfect. So. He did, he did well. And that's some, you know, you, your body took a beating to ensure that he did well. And yep. you, you really hit rock bottom in the subsequent weeks because they didn't, yep. weren't diagnosed at that time. You, no. the hardest part about having a baby is sometimes not the baby. It's going home with a newborn, firstborn child and then My God. figuring out how to take care of it. And in those eight hard weeks, you weren't just not sleeping and working hard and yeah. trying to uh, breastfeed like everyone else. You were exhausted, salt craving, unable to breastfeed, nauseous, vomiting, and you showed up several weeks, a couple of months after the delivery, basically cra crashing. And uh, it, it, yeah, uh, not it was, um, it was of course it was unbelievable. The the uh, I again a lot of the things I I people were saying could be explained away. You know, what's well, you, your you know, your postpartum, your hormonal. And I had, I couldn't get out of bed. I had every bone in my body, every part of my body ached. I would get up and stand up and have to change a diaper. What, how many times a day? A onesie, one, how many times a day? And I would have to physically hold on to things to get to say the changing table or to go get a bottle. And I was breastfeeding and I was, I mean, 
I thought my nipples were literally going to fall off. Like it was just the, the excruciating pain in every sense of the word. Um, it was, and then ultimately, um, I had, I had gone to the doctor and I said, please, 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 something's wrong with me. I know there's something wrong with me. And, um, the, there was a sodium test that was run, but they missed it. I went away for a weekend. I couldn't stop vomiting. I didn't sleep for probably three days. Um, cause I was in so much pain and I just kept throwing up and, um, I called my primary care. I went in, I couldn't stand up. I was collapsing, throwing up in her office. And she said, I don't know what's wrong with you. Just like Jack, I don't know what's wrong with you, but something's wrong with you. Um, and I went to the ER. So, and I remember never, I'll never forget walking. It was like uh, that, that period of time where I would walk, it was almost like things got dizzy. It was just horrifying it was very scary um yeah, so these were your labs at that time which i think the students will see as very diagnostic for addison's primary adrenal insufficiency as well as hypothyroidism and did you notice a difference when you were treated oh my god i mean my my stepmother likes to talk about it she's like it was like you were bouncing off the walls. <laughs> i was so happy to feel normal again but most of all I felt like with Jack was saying I wasn't crazy I knew there was something wrong with me and I wasn't crazy anymore and there really was something wrong with me and I wasn't losing my life I it was going to be okay I didn't understand the disease and really what it was about but I I knew that I could get help and I could you know feel better again and I did almost immediately um, and you know, it was, it was pretty awesome to feel that way, to feel like I could be a mom. Cause I was, you know, feeling like I wasn't a good mom and it was hard. So it was pretty awesome to right. feel, you know, good again. So that's around the time I met you. And I'll just fast forward this because I think then we'll end it on a very happy note. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you were feeling way better. So this is the kind of miraculous improvement that I was mentioning earlier. But yep. when I met you, you weren't a hundred percent, and it was hard to know how much of it was being a mom of a uh, of a young toddler versus insufficient hydrocortisone dosing. And I think at that time I had increased your doses, and that and then you had said this is the best I ever felt. Yeah. Then you were yeah. pregnant again. And I think what's nice about Corinne's story is not only how dramatic it is, is that you were basically pregnant twice in a span of you know one and a half years and so, and so but in one case you were untreated and in the second case i obviously treated you uh with a more robust dosing and we increased your dosing through the gestation of the individual trimesters you did great during that pregnancy you felt very well and you had a yep. healthy baby and this is you um Basically, a year and a half or two years after the last pictures I showed you. So you had two kids. 20, in, actually, it was 22 months to the 22 day. Months, exactly. 22 months to the day and, that I had uh, her. I don't think any yep. words are needed to see the difference between you uh, 22 months later, two pregnancies. <laughs> uh, I'm just putting a side by side because this is on the left, 22 months earlier, untreated. This is 22 months later, treated, two pregnancies. So uh, you look like you were feeling better the second time is that about right the oh up? my god I was like let's have another baby this is great <laughs> <laughs> so good and it was just I you know what I I just appreciated every single moment of life with that baby as a young tiny because it was like I felt like I got I didn't I was cheated with didn't get that with Will and I had it with my daughter and it was pretty awesome. Yeah. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And she was a chunker. <laughs> so she had some good weight on her and uh, she did not have a problem growing. So. Awesome. That is, that is it was really great. nice to hear. So yeah. we, we are almost out of time. Um, but I want to, I want to finish with you guys. Maybe if you have any thoughts, uh, you know, the audience is uh, medical students. Um, but if you had any comments to share with students, doctors in training, or even physicians um, and other healthcare providers, uh, you know, I would like to leave that 
for you guys to finish. Um, you can go one at a time. Anything you want to say or share, uh, that would be great. I'd, I'd like to say, be curious. Uh, you know, it wasn't until the nephrologist and that hospitalist who had the natural curiosity to say, what is wrong with this? <laughs> this person shouldn't feel this way, shouldn't have blood pressure this low. And, and I felt passed off at times from doc to doc. And these two, God bless them, put a stake in the ground and said, we're going to figure this out. Great. Yeah. I agree with you, Jack. I think that is the biggest thing is being curious, asking questions. And, you know, I kept going back and I wasn't being listened to. And I didn't expect my doctors to know the answers. I just wanted them to look into it and try. Um, and at the time, unfortunately, I wasn't with those particular doctors that were doing that. So. Yeah. I, um, first I want to say thank you. Thank you for going into the profession. Um, I'm so grateful to, for healthcare, uh, bottom line. And, uh, so I, I think if you told me 10 years ago, I'd be doing this, I would have felt so much better 10 years ago. Cause I think I was a little bit angry, uh, and, and not necessarily rightfully. So I, I was angry at my doctor. I was angry at a nutritionist. I saw I was, I was angry at everyone. Um, because I felt like this was so obvious. Look at me. Look at how sick I was. Uh, why didn't anybody listen to me? Um, but in, in retrospect, you realize how difficult what, we, what this is and uh, what we have and, and how rare it really is. So I want to say thank you for, for entering this profession. Um, it's a huge responsibility. And um, look beyond you know, what's right in front of you. Sometimes you know, saying, I don't know, it's the best thing you can say. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Great. Well, I wanted to thank all of you again, uh, not just for this time, for, for all the times you have taken time out of your schedules and being the, and uh, came and spoken to the Harvard Medical students, um, and also just for sharing your stories, even the kind of personal and private parts. It's really how uh, students and doctors and people in healthcare learn. So we're very grateful for that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.